Working with game states is a way that we can control the flow of our program. Because if we think about it, our setup function runs once, our draw function runs about 60 times a second. It just keeps going and going and going and going, much like the at a movie theater where the images are changing on screen, there it's 24 frames a second. You watch TV, your television's updating at about 60 times per second, you're getting a new image on screen. So it's that same kind of process. So we're continually updating what we see on screen. But game states allows us to take and control kind of what set of instructions are controlling what we're seeing on screen at any given time. So if we think about it, I mean, programming in general is kind of like following a recipe when you're cooking. We have our ingredients or our variables, then we have a set of instructions. We follow those instructions in order to get the correct result. But what ends up happening here is we set up the instructions and set up and then draw, they just keep looping indefinitely as long as the program runs. So if we have a bunch of instructions and don't want everything to always be going at the same time, because in the beginning we want to provide our viewer with information and say, okay, yeah, well, hey, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Here's the name of my game. Here's the instructions of how to play it. You know, click this button when you're ready to start playing. And then we have the game that's going to run, and then we can see the game running. And then after the game finishes running, then we're either going to make a determination. Has the player succeeded and won, or has they, have they lost? So we work through that process. And when we use a state system to take control of that, that gives us a lot more ability to make a completed application. So not just kind of a section of what would be a completed program or application, but now it's the whole deal. It's the whole real deal. And that's where we use our game states. Now, a convenient way to organize it is to simplify our draw function. And we use a conditional or an if statement to say, hey, if the game state is start, call the start game function. If the game state is play, call the play game function. If the game state is win, call the win game function. If the game state is lose, call the lose game function. Now we can see in game state master how those functions are stubbed out. So they're waiting for you to put content in. So under start, we'd put the information about, hey, welcome here. You know, here's how to play. You know, click to continue. And then it would listen for the user to press the mouse. When they press the mouse, it will change our game state from start to play. And then the next loop of draw will say, oh look, we're no longer under start. Our game state has a play value. So then it calls play game. And play game is where you put all of those instructions that we had last time under draw, where it was like, here, draw the catcher. Here, draw the drops. Find out if the drops have intersected the catcher and all that other stuff that we were doing. That all happens in play. Somewhere in play, it needs to evaluate and say, hey, is someone a winner or a loser? And if so, change the game state appropriately, and then we can call win and lose game. So the game state master, this file would be a good one to just keep in your reference library. So the next time you're working on a project and say, oh, I need to, this will be a state-based project where it will have a start, it will have a play, a win, lose, level up, or however you figure out those states, you use this as the beginning point and then you end up filling out the content inside things later. So this becomes a nice template file that can be reused from project to project to project because we're pretty much going to follow this state system or state process in most projects you do for the remainder of the term because it allows you to create a completed application. Now to see it in operation, I'm opening up game state two, which has those states there. Now this isn't the catcher game. This is going to be something a little bit different. But when it runs, we look at it and it says, hey, click to play. Go left to win, go right to lose. All right, so it's telling me what to do. It's telling me click the mouse to play. All right, so I'll click the mouse. And okay, I'm here. Well, okay, nothing's happening yet. All right. So it said go right to win. Or left to win, I forget. Left to win. So I'll go left. I go left. Oh. Wait. 
apparently it's not a very nice game. But now it says again. Well, I can probably, oh look, if I click it started the game over. Okay, well then I'll go to the right. Oh look, now I can, so I can now just keep playing this worthless game. If I go up and down, nothing's happening. So it just seems based on where I'm moving for what's happening. So right now, it says you win. If I look in my program, it says, okay, if game state is win, it calls my win game function. So if I scroll down and look for my win game function, I'll see, oh, win game. It says, hey, if mouse is pressed, change the game state back to play. That's cool. And then it has some information about, oh, we'll, we'll have a string, and then we'll have some text things, and then draw some text on screen on screen and then it does it again where the text is now of a different size okay that's cool so I click here oh and let's see now we're under play game if I oh well when I was in play game we can see okay it sets the fill color to red draws an ellipse where the mouse is and then it does the check hey is the mouse less than 50 game state becomes lose if the mouse is um, greater than the width of the screen minus 50 then game state becomes win okay so there's my check to find out if the player has won or lost here I draw the player on screen but that's all in play game so when my game state is play that's what's happening one other thing to keep in mind before we start migrating everything over now enter my start game method here The first thing it does is it says hey if mouse pressed then it changes the game state. So what it's doing is it's now listening for you to press the mouse. And if you press the mouse, then it's going to change the game state. That's how that is set up to work. Now when the game is running, it's no longer listening for a mouse press, so it's never going to notice whether you press it or not. But after I've won or lost, if I press the mouse in there, it's going to start listening again to find out, hey, if you press the mouse, change the game state to play but if I wanted it not to be play I could even send the person back to start and then they would have to they'd be on the start screen then they could click where it says click to play then I'd click so you don't have to immediately send it back into the game you could send it back to start and then they click that to play the game and it's how you want to structure your flow chart of how you want your game loop to be but we're going to integrate now this concept of states into the rest of the catcher game. Integrate my current catcher game with the game states that we had. I'll find it useful to just leave them both on screen so I can see what's going on. So I am going to progressively grab pieces of my game state master and migrate them over to my uh, kind of what was the game zero from last session. So that means I will need to reference game state and that is a string. So I will need that variable. I'll bring that over. I will also need to populate it inside my setup method here. So that's now been populated. So what we're doing is we're progressively moving the content from Game State Master into our game here. So I've Grab the variable, I've grabbed its initial starting value. Clear background, I don't need to touch that. But I do need to now grab this whole conditional block that says if game state is start, else if game state is play, if us win, lose, that whole chunk. So I need to grab that, make sure we're getting all of the curly braces that belong to it, not just, you know, some of them, otherwise your code will break. Then I go into my game file and paste. 
Now, processing is actually being kind of nice to me right now. And if you pay attention, you will realize that it recognizes I am asking for functions that don't exist yet because it underlined them with the red squiggly line. So I can see it's now underlining start game, play game, win game, and lose game, and it's telling me that I have no clue what those are. So it's underlining those saying, um, you better do something about that because I don't know what they are. And that would be these functions down here that we have yet to move over and then we'll have to populate these with actual stuff. And that's what we will be doing very shortly. So now these four functions of start game, win game, lose game, and play game, not in that order. So I grab those four functions, copy those, and then I will go down in my code and I think a nice place to do it will be right above clear background. We'll leave clear background and intersect to the bottom. So I can just go put some extra returns in there so I have some room to play. And I'll paste and I now put those four functions in. So we've moved all of the content from our game state file over that we need and now we just need to start moving things around inside our game itself because we want our draw function when it's done is going to look just like this and it will end right after a lose game there so that means all of this content that was our previous catcher game I'm gonna grab that which was I have my timer I have my catcher and I have my drops, those three items that are part of the game. Those were part of play game. I'm going to cut those, get them out of there, and those are now going to become part of play game. So now our setup is still going to work the way it is here and then we have draw which is now much cleaner and our draw function does a little bit of uh, asking around and saying hey what what is the game state and then it calls a bunch of functions but it's not actually doing any you know real work it's not displaying the catcher it's not displaying the drops it's not checking to see if things intersect draw is just running our state system that says what are we supposed to do right now? So depending on game state, it asks that question. So if it is start, do start game. If our game state is play. So it's asking that question of what should I do? Looks up game state. Once it knows what game state is, then it does that. Now, if I were to run my project right now, it's going to be a really disappointing moment. Because I'll hit play. It's going to come up, and I will see a white screen. And that's really disappointing because I have all of this programming code that I've now typed and I get a white screen and no error messages. Text on screen is not something that is super uh, involved. We need to figure out what are the words or the string that we're putting on screen then we can specify where we want it to show up. We also have other options where we can specify if we want text to be aligned, center, left, right, etc. We can specify a size to it. We can specify color by using fill. If I say fill, that determines the color it's going to fill the text with. And that's really all there is to setting our text. So if under start game, I decide now it's time to put some text in there. There's two ways I could do it. I could just simply put in the word text and then in quotation marks put click to play and then I specify where I want that to show up and I could say something like 100 comma 100 like this and now when I run my project I'll see that text is not showing up because I need to also set a fill color because the fill color was set to white when I was clearing the background so then I did white text on a white background didn't really show up. Now black text 
boring. Small text, boring. Location of the text, lame. So we need to think about how we want to do that. Now, you can figure out, okay, how big is the text when I specify the size and then have it left, by default text is left alignment or left justified. So if we want to change that alignment of it, we can see the method of how we might go about doing that. So then I can actually, I, I want to do that above my fill color though. I'm gonna go right here. If I say text align, we have options of center, left, right. We also can choose, is the text centered on its baseline or is the text above or below the baseline? So we have options like that as well. By default, it's drawing the text from the top left corner. But if I say center, it now assumes we want the text to be centered if I spelled the word align right. But apparently I can't type today. Now if I want to adjust my size, text size, and now we're specifying a size in pixels, which is essentially in points. So if I wanted it to be decently big, make it big. Now if I look, if I'm centering it here, and then I say click to play, well, centering the text, if I want it centered, my X should really be the width of my project divided by two, because that's the middle of the screen. Now I could set the height of my text to be height, divided by two, so now it's centered vertically and horizontally on the screen. Now if I run the project, we'll see that I have bigger text showing up on screen. Sometimes people will want to put a button on screen, so you draw something that looks like a button to give the user further input. It's like, oh, click on this. Now what you can do is you can draw yourself an ellipse on screen and then you can check to find out is the user, is their mouse in that ellipse and if so then you do what you need to do. So I mean you can do that. Your book has instructions on how to create a button. But realistically, when, unless you have multiple buttons, there's really no reason to have any button. Unless you have different buttons and the buttons will lead you to different locations, which could be further game states because you don't have to have just one play, but you could have multiple plays that would play one, play two, play three, and each one is doing something different. So then you'd have three buttons on screen, and that would be cool. But then you would have to track where is the user clicking. You can read about creating a button in your book. We're not gonna go there this afternoon. But if you want to, you know, go nuts. And if you want you know, more insight in that, you know, ask, and we'll set up an example of that at a future time. Now if I want to find out if they clicked, all I have to do is say if mouse pressed is true, so I can do this, or because it's the same as saying if mouse pressed, which says if mouse pressed is true. So I'm asking that question. Has the user pressed the mouse? And if they press the mouse, we need to update the game state. And we set game state equal to play. So if they press the mouse it changes their game state from what was start to play. When it becomes play then what we're going to notice is we get to start playing our game. There's one subtle thing we will probably want to do which is we really don't want our timer to start running until we've told the game to start playing. It's not a big deal here for the drops, but if, say, we had a countdown timer on screen, so we were keeping track of time that way, then it's becoming more of an issue. So I am going to comment this version of timer start out here. You can delete it, but I just want to leave it as reference so I remember it. That's where I used to do it. And right where I'm updating my game state, I will also say I want my timer to start. So when I press the mouse, I start the timer, which causes the drops to start falling, and then I change my game state to play, and then we get to play the game. Now, if I have done everything correctly here, which I might have, I hit play, comes up, click to play, okay? No error messages, words are still on screen, I'm going to hit my mouse, catcher's there, and the drops start falling. 
Okay. So that's good. And there are 10 drops, I believe. So we are done. Yep, 10 drops. So we cut all 10. Okay. So we now have it working, except for the problem of okay, I cut all 10. Theoretically, that would probably be a win. So we need to figure out what to do about that. The thought process for integrating the score would be, well, one, I need to keep track of that. If I'm keeping track of something, that means it's going to be a variable. So I will say int score. And then inside my setup, well, it's going to make sense that my score should be 0 to begin with. So that's a starting point of, I need to keep track of it. I'm going to set my initial value to 0. And then while I'm playing the game, I want to provide that information to the user that, hey, I, you know, I know what your score is. I bet you want to know too. So we need to put some more text on screen. This time we'll put text inside our game state. So in play game, as good a place as any, I'll just set a fill color so I know my text will be colored with what I want it to be filled with. And I'm just going to do black text since I have a white background. You can use whatever color makes you happy if you want chartreuse or periwinkle or lime green. You know, figure out the color numbers for it and put it in. And I'm going to have, now I'm going to call it my score text. And it's going to be equal to the word score, colon, put a space so then the number doesn't butt up against it. Do a plus, and then I will put in my variable score. So the section in quotes is text that's going to go up on screen, and I'm going to append that with my score value here. hit run. You'll see if there's no score yet. If I click play, there's still no score on screen because while well, I made the string, I forgot to actually display it. So I figured out what I want to see on screen, but I need to then say where. And I need to say text, score, text, and then an x and y location. So if I just put it my x, I will go in 20. And my y, I'm going to go down 20. And we'll see how that works. Now, if we look, we'll realize that the alignment and size of the text is carrying over from what was in start game. In start game, the text was size 24. It was aligned center. So my score is now size 24, aligned center. So if I don't want my score that big or if I wanted a different size, I probably need to change it. And this is part of the figuring out, okay, when you're displaying text, Generally, it's a good practice to, you reference the fill color, you reference the align, and you reference the size before you display it. So I want it to be left, not centered, and a little bit smaller. I'm going to go for 18. Now when I run it, I should see it's over there. And I. I like the size, but I need to pull it down a little bit. Size 18, but positioned at 20 means it's about two pixels from the top. That's a little tight. So I'm going to just change that to a 30. Try again. Let's see how it looks. And that's a more comfortable position for my score text. So now we can see the score text is there. Now you will notice if I, because I'm drawing the text at the beginning of my play game function, and then I draw the catcher after, the catcher can cover it up. If you don't want that, then you need to put this text stuff at the bottom of play game instead of at the top of play game. So now we have the text showing up on screen for my score. That's awesome. But we're not adding to the score. I'm not making my score get bigger yet. 
So we need to modify the game a little bit to do that. So we need to figure out how do I add to my score? Well, thinking through the logic of it, well, my score should go up when I'm catching one of the drops. That makes sense. So if I'm going to catch a drop, the drop gets caught here when intersect is true. So at that point, I can just simply say score plus plus. And that says score is equal to score plus one. So I've now updated my score by one. We still don't have any way to lose the game yet. I'm not checking to see if I've won the game yet, but at least I'm going to be able to see my score go up. I really recommend when you are doing something like this that you do one thing and then test it. If you try and integrate all the features of, okay, I draw the text, I add the score, I check to see if I have one, I do all of the stuff, and then I hit run, and something breaks, well, which is the broken part then? So we've discovered that there's a flaw. There's all kinds of uh, usability flaws to work through, but if I catch something, I can now go down to the bottom, and as long as I wait on the objects that are there, I can watch my score go up. For catching 10 drops, well, I can get a pretty nice score. That's cheating. So we need to figure out how to take that feature away from the user. Well, when drops are caught, if we look at the drop in the drop class, when it's caught, it just dumped it down here. But if we send the drops to a location that the catcher has no possible way of ever arriving at, then we can't do it. Now, if you remember, the reason why we sent them to the bottom but didn't make them disappear in the first place is we wanted confirmation that the object was actually being caught. That was the reason why we left it on screen. So we had confirmation, we knew it was there. To overcome this, we could send it to height and we could just add to that or we it sometimes is better though in this case to go to a negative number and the reason why we go to a negative number is because if for some reason the screen gets stretched or you know you resize a window then that becomes still visible or the catcher can get to it if we go negative you can never get above zero when you're stretching a window windows always get bigger but zero is still zero so it's impossible for our catcher to ever make it to a negative position off screen. So if I just did something like negative r times 10, that would put it, in this case, 80 pixels off screen. And if my object has a bigger r, then it's going to be that much further off screen. So if I just change that location to some negative number way off screen, I, I mean, I could just do negative 1,000, and that guarantees I would never have an object that's a thousand pixels big that I'm trying to catch because that would well it just wouldn't work based on our monitor sizes so then that would work but it's nice to have a number that's proportional to the size of the object so it guarantees bigger objects are that much further off screen so they don't because if I said like negative 20 okay well it's off screen now but if I replace it with a picture and that picture is 50 pixels psi suddenly now it's back on screen so that would be bad so by changing inside my drop class where it goes when it's caught, it gives us a really easy out. So now when I hit play and catch them, they disappear. So now I can't game the system. So now I can catch all 10. That's good. Now we need to make it, if I've caught 10, that I can win. So score goes up. Well. If I want to say if I catch all 10 of 1, I can say if score is equal to, and this is where if I typed in 10, that's great, but if I change the number of falling drops, well, then that's going to break it. So we do know that that number of drops is actually, you know, it's the number of drops is drops.length. Because if I suddenly go and change it, well, i got to catch 100. Well, if there's 100 drops, then it's 100. So if we're tying it that we're always going to have to catch all the drops, it makes sense then to then say drops.length. But if I want it to be a smaller number, now if you do have 100 drops falling in your game, when you're doing testing to find out if you have one, you probably don't want to catch all 100. So you would put a smaller number here, like 3 or 5. 
but if 10, that's a manageable amount. And then I just simply update my game state once more, set game state equal to win. So once I have caught all the drops, my score is equal to the number of drops, my game state becomes win. But if I don't want it to be that, if I want it to be a lower number because I have 100 or 1,000 things all falling, and I want to test my project, catching all 100 is super annoying. So that's probably not how you, you would want to change that to a different number. So now if I hit go and catch all 10, 1, 2, 3, and now I'm at win. Now nothing's showing up on screen because well, my game state win doesn't show anything yet. So I will want to then put some text in my win, put some text in my lose, and also then come up with a method or process by which the user can lose the game and then figure out how to replay the game as well. So for putting the text in, it really is going to be kind of like the big text that I used on the starting screen. So I would do something like, oh, like this. Copy all of that. Go under win, and then say, you win, bunch of exclamation points. And then if I want to sit, you know, tell them, click to play again, I can put another line of text, but I can also insert a line return by typing the character backslash n. So the slash above the return key. So if I do the backslash above the return key and then say click to play again. So this backslash n creates a line return. It breaks my line into two. Now I'm also going to modify it because I don't like catching all 10 right now and I'm just going to change it to three to make it a little bit faster for doing the demo. So if I catch three, win game is going to show up. And I'll see it happen. Click to play. So one, two, three. I won. And now watch what happens when I click to play again. Now we'll notice my score is 10. I, wait. And it didn't read, yeah, so we, we have some issues here that we have to figure out. We have to figure out how to reset the whole game. And that's, we'll work through that, and then we'll figure out how to put in lose, because once we have win working correctly, it's really easy to integrate losing. After, after lose game, I'm just going to start filling this in. We'll call this reset game, and we'll be calling this from win and lose. So to reset the game, I'm just going to make a note of what we need to do. We need to, let me scroll up so it's easier to see. We need to reset the score. We need to reset the drops. Um, and reset the game state. Okay. So if we're doing these different things, if we look here where we win, when we press the mouse, we're effectively you know, resetting the game. Well, we can go grab these lines here, and that's resetting the game state. So, and that's inside win game, these lines here. So I'm going to just cut those out and replace them with reset game. So then that's where we would call it. When I press the mouse, pressing the mouse, it makes sense that when I click the mouse, that is resetting the game. So here, we reset those. Now, we have to figure out how to reset the score and then reset the drops. Resetting the score If I, inside resetting my score, if I just say score is equal to zero, 
Same thing as what I did in, when I started the game. I started the game by setting the score to zero, so now it makes sense reset. So I'm gonna test it before I worry about the drops and verify that this is indeed working. So if I hit go, click to play, catch one, two, three. Hey, I win. One, two, three. Hey, I win. One, two, three. Hey, I win. Oh, wait. There's only now one drop because there were ten, and if I keep winning, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. But at least we know most of it's kind of working, but I just haven't figured out how to reset the the drop class we will notice that the drops oh look at that there was something hiding in there all along way back there was something hiding in the drops to reset the drops waiting for this prime moment it's like you knew, man. It, it, it's totally like I had a vision and it just magically seemed appropriate to put that there because there might be an opportunity that we needed it yeah, it was hallucination, vision, whatever you want to call it. Okay. But if we look at it, we kind of are doing that when the drops are rolling off the screen. We move them to a new X. We set their Y so it's up at the top. And then we give them a random speed. So those three activities are really what it takes to reset a drop of move it on the X, get it back to the top of the screen ready to fall again, and give it a speed. Because the reason that a drop stops falling is when it's caught, we killed its speed. That's the only actual reason the drop stopped. Because we, when it's caught, we said, you don't have speed anymore. That's why we could park them at the bottom, now we're parking them off screen, but we killed their speed. So to reset the drop, what we really need to do is just to reset the speed, but we might as well just take all the drops and do all of these things in our reset. So now that resets them. And for that matter, because that's three lines of code repeating twice, it would make more sense to call reset here. So I'm not repeating that code. Because anytime you're repeating lines of code, it should probably be a function that you call. The reset. The drops can reset themselves. So I made a change to the drop class. I'm going to run my program once more just to verify before I do anything else. Okay. Well, let's see. I'll let one go off screen. All right. They seem like they're looping. All right. So it does seem like it's working. But now we need to figure out how to call that as part of resetting the drops here in our reset game. The drops now have the method to reset themselves. We have to use it. So to reset the drops, this is where we are going to use our standard for loop, like we did right up, you know, kind of up here or even. Um, so we are going to be using essentially this for loop that is inside our setup. The for int i zero i is less than drops at length i plus plus and then it drops made a new drop but instead of making new drops we're going to tell the drops to reset. So I could retype all of that or I can copy that and then go down. So I copied it and now under my reset here, resetting the drops, paste that in, but instead of a new drop, I need to tell each drop to reset. So drop side uh, reset. So we tell the drop to reset. Now it is nice um, in processing three, if I say drop side dot, we can actually see the methods that are part of it. Reset, hey, you know. Now, other ones, you know, I didn't create those. They're not part of our class, but reset is. So now that cycles through all the drops and it tells each drop to reset itself. 
And now if I hit go, and we can go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Okay, now we're, it looks like we're not quite done because now the game resets, but when it resets, all the drops are falling. Because if we remember, we used the timer last time and we used active drops, so we probably have to reset active drops back to its starting value as well. And this is one of those remembering all the little things that you have to reset. You run it and you're like, oops, I forgot about that one. Because I, I legitimately and totally forgot that I needed to say active drops is equal to zero. So we start out where active drops is zero. Because that's what, when our game starts, back up at the top, active drops begins at zero. So in my reset, reset the score, reset the drops, reset active drops, tell my timer to start, change the game state to play. If I'm lucky, I have everything I need now. Let's see, one, two, three, click to play. One, two, three, two, three. If the drop has indeed gone off screen, we can say drops i dot um, So we're going to ask it if it's a uh, oh, oh, we need to put that in a con sorry, inside a if drops i dot hit bottom because you know the drop has hit rock bottom now you know that's you know what we're asking yeah our drops have a pro you know they got some you know substance abuse issues here they've hit rock bottom so if our drop does hit rock bottom then we need to do something with that so we're going to ask the drop have you hit bottom once again we can see that processing realizes hit bottom doesn't exist yet it underlined it with the squiggly red so it's telling us yeah you better do something about that so if I go into the drop, that would be, we're asking, have you hit bottom? Now, we need to figure out what that's going to look like. Oh, but it's not going to be a void. But it, like intersect, it's a boolean. It's returning a value here. So it's going to return something. And right now I'm just going to leave it at return false so it doesn't break the code or do anything else as we start to and work this out. Um, so we're going to hit rock bottom and deal with that next session. But right now, if we look at uh, in uh, game three that you were able to uh, access or download, we have a countdown timer. We don't need, you don't need to, if you just look at it, it's enough because then we're going to recreate this inside the rest of our project here and we'll put that into our uh, game state. We'll put in the countdown timer. Now the cool part about putting in a countdown timer is when our game runs, comes up, so this is back on our click to play, go left and right. This puts some pressure on the player. They have to make a decision on which way to go before the timer runs out. And it doesn't tell them how much time they have at the beginning, but we can see it's going to start out with five. So if I click here, five, four, three, two, one. If I run out, we lose. And because there's no reset built into this, where the timer is not resetting or anything else, we can see that I am still the, a big loser. The concept on the countdown timer is we construct a second timer object. We need to keep track of how much time is left and then we will display that to the user. Just like we show them the score, we can show them the time. When the timer is running, we 
tell the countdown timer to start. And inside play game, we ask countdown timer, we say, hey, are you done? Just like the drop timer we used before. Now, if time is still greater than one, we take one away, then we tell the timer to start its next cycle. Now, the timer is running 1,000 milliseconds or one second intervals. But if time left is less than one, that means our game state switches to lose because we've now run out of time. So that's the method. And then we just need to show it to the user when we put it on screen so they get that little extra anxiety of like, oh crap, the time is counting down. I need to get a move on with this. So I'm going to leave this as reference and we're going to go back into our state system here and we can see we have our existing timer. So now I'm going to go a little further down. And this will be now a second timer. And this will be my countdown timer. And then I will also need an uh, integer to store how much time is left. Now it makes sense to use an integer because we're displaying time in whole numbers. And our timer is counting in one second intervals. Now if you change that and want to show fractional time so it looks like a, you know, a speeding clock, then you would need to feed a different number to timer. You would need to have a different amount of time left so it would know how many iterations to go through. And you can worry about doing that if that's your preference. Now, the next step is to define these values. So now I say count down timer is equal to a new timer and 1000 milliseconds it's going to run time time left we will set I'm going to just give the player five seconds may not be enough time to actually catch three drops so that's good it adds to the stress level of the game we don't want it to be too easy I want to make you know some difficulty there so we've created the variables, we've populated the variables. We will also need to notice that time left of five will probably need to add that into our reset function because otherwise, just like active drops when that didn't reset, when time left doesn't reset, then our game won't go very well because time left will still be zero. So with that, I'm just going to know I need to do that right now. So before I do anything else with the timer, we're going to go into reset. And this will be time left is equal to 5. And count down timer dot start. So reset's been fixed because otherwise it would have been broken and we might as well get that in ahead of time. Now inside our game, this is where we're going to need to start getting things working. Now when I start the game, I tell the timer, my original timer is controlling my drops. Then I need to tell my countdown timer to start as well. So that is inside my start game function. I tell the countdown timer to start. Then what we are going to need to do is we're going to need to check with that countdown timer, hey, have you finished? If so, you know, take off a number and then if you're not at zero, start again and start again and start again and start again and work through it that way. Now I'm going to just get some text on screen that will allow us to see that. So in game three pretty much has the code that we need to run our game timer and I'm going to reference that and talk through what each line of that's doing. But that's in my play game. So inside my play game we have the text up here which is displaying the score. 
What I'm going to do is figure out uh, now, I displayed some text on screen for the score. I'm going to leave my alignment left. I'm going to, actually no, I'm not. I'm going to go text line right because I'm going to go put the text close to the right margin. Size can remain the same. Fill will still then be the same. And then string timer text is equal to time colon end quote plus and this is where we need to figure out you know, what we're going to put there which is time left. So this is where we're now displaying it. So it starts out my time left will be five and then each tick of the clock is going to make time left go down by one whole number. The next thing that we need to figure out is how to show that and what we're doing is using the timer object but this time it's our countdown timer so if countdown timer dot complete so when it's complete then we need some curly braces as part of it to shut my phone down there. Okay, so countdown timer is complete. Now we are going to be working with the code over there on the right, which is if my time left is greater than one, meaning I haven't zeroed out yet, time left is going to be subtracted. So time left will lose one tick that's the double minus. Double plus adds one, double minus subtracts one. And then we tell our countdown timer to start over. Curly brace. Well if time was or is not greater than one that means we have run out. So then we'll say else And put in my closing curly brace, go up one, and then at this point we can declare ourselves losers. And say game state is now equal to lose. So the when the countdown timer is complete, that means it's ticked off one second. If there's still more than one second left, we take off one second tell the timer to start over. Now the next time if count time left is one, well one is not greater than one, therefore we have now lost and game state will become lose and we can now lose our game. Which does lose even have anything in it yet? Win, lose game. No, lose is empty so the screen will go blank at that point but that's okay. We can easily fix that in a moment. So now I'm going to run this and verify it's working. Click to play. And... Um, well, I, same problem I had when I set the score. I never... I forgot to actually say text score and put... or a timer and put the time text on screen. Same thing I forgot with my... when I was doing scoring. So I do text timer text comma instead of 20 I will do with minus 20 comma 30. So they're at the same height but this one is now justified against the right margin. Let's see if it works this time. And now we can see the time is in the corner. 4, 3, 2, 1. Boom. We lost. And there's no way to reset it yet because on the lose screen we have no option for that. To complete this, I'm going to grab the contents of my win game, add that to my lose game, but change the message to you lost. 
you know, you could be less, you know, polite about it and be more insulting if you want, or you could be more, uh, you know, touchy-feely and say, it's okay, I, you'll do better next time.